Welcome to SNC's podcast series, SNC Critical Insights. I am Krishna Varagavan, a partner in SNC's M&A practice group based in our New York office. Today, I'm going to be discussing considerations for directors in navigating challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath are creating a number of new challenges for businesses. Strong oversight, coordination, and leadership by the board of directors working closely with management will be critical in managing this fluid and complex situation and its impact on a company's business, operations, prospects, employees, stockholders, and other stakeholders. First, I'm gonna be discussing corporate governance considerations for ensuring that the board is adequately prepared and well positioned to operate effectively and address these new challenges. The pandemic is heightening the importance of an engaged board as companies forge a path through uncertain times ahead. Among other challenges, boards are being called upon to understand, adapt to, and reduce, to the extent possible, pandemic-related risks, implement and refine best practices in a constantly changing environment, reassess short and long-term business plans and strategy, liquidity, debt, and available financing and capital allocation, reevaluate M&A strategy and activity, evaluate director and employee compensation and benefit arrangements, and communicate and engage with employees, stockholders, and other stakeholders regarding the pandemic and ordinary course matters. It is imperative that the board is able to maintain an open and constructive dialogue, both amongst its board members and between the board and management, so that the board can react quickly and appropriately to address the challenges presented. For example, the board should carefully consider delegating emergency pandemic responses to a standing or newly formed committee of the board. Utilizing a committee would allow maximum flexibility to act quickly in emergencies. However, these powers should be delegated carefully such that they are only used in actual emergency situations where it is impractical to wait for the full board to convene. This flexibility can be especially beneficial where one or more directors are executives of companies that are facing similar challenges and therefore have more limited bandwidth. The pandemic also presents practical difficulties for board communications. Directors, like many of us around the world, including those resident in SNC's New York offices, are adjusting to working remotely. Many boards that historically have met for key sessions in person are now gathering by phone or video conference to accommodate public health precautions. However, even while working and communicating remotely, directors and officers must be mindful of maintaining corporate formalities and should be careful not to fall into habits of interacting in more informal ways. Remote gatherings necessarily mean that more materials containing confidential company information will be transmitted electronically. It is important that directors and management continue to comply with best practices from a confidentiality perspective and that this information remains adequately secure. Companies may also want to evaluate their technology and cybersecurity capabilities to understand whether any additional processes or procedures would help ensure directors are able to conduct their meetings and other communications in a matter that preserves the confidentiality of board discussion. Boards should be particularly mindful of the fact that, since nearly all board communications will be virtual for the foreseeable future, plaintiffs making demands under Section 220 of the Delaware General Corporate Law may have an easier time getting access to more informal electronic communications regarding discussions, decisions made by board during this time period. As such, directors should operate as if all communications will be made part of the public record. As the 2020 annual stockholder meeting dates draw closer, many companies are considering holding a virtual stockholder meeting due to the public health concerns associated with public gatherings as a result of the pandemic. A high number of companies have recently filed proxy statements saying that they will conduct their annual meeting virtually or that they are preserving the option to switch from a physical meeting to a virtual meeting at a later date. Virtual meetings can either be completely virtual or they can be hybrid meetings where the company offers both an in-person and virtual option. A virtual meeting is different from a simple live stream or conference call because stockholders must have the ability to cast votes during the meeting. This generally requires a third-party service provider to provide the platforms or stockholder voting and help coordinate logistics of the meeting. 
Prior to making the switch to a virtual only or hybrid meeting, it's important for companies and boards to consider the legal requirements under the company's governing documents, state law, and federal regulations, which have been evolving as both the SEC and state governments react to coronavirus. From a state and organizational document perspective, the legal backdrop will differ depending on the law of the state of the company's incorporation. For example, Delaware law generally allows virtual-only meetings if the board is authorized to determine the place of a meeting of stockholders in the company's organizational documents, which is typical. Other states, such as New York, that did not have a statute expressly permitting virtual meetings are issuing executive orders to permit virtual-only meetings in light of public health concerns. Under SEC rules, the company will have disclosure obligations surrounding a switch to a virtual meeting, the nature of which will depend on whether the company has already mailed and filed its definitive proxy material. Generally speaking, the board will need to take action to switch to a virtual meeting. Companies and boards should also be mindful of proxy advisor and institutional investor policies regarding virtual meetings. Virtual-only meetings have, in the past, been subject to criticism by proxy advisors and institutional investors. However, this has already begun to change as proxy advisors weigh the effects of the pandemic. While ISS has not yet adopted a formal voting policy on virtual-only meetings in the U.S., Glass-Lewis issued new guidance this month, noting that for the duration of the 2020 proxy season, it will review virtual meetings on a case-by-case basis, taking the extenuating circumstances of the pandemic into account. ISS has also signaled that in response to the pandemic, they may change their policies with regard to virtual-only meetings for 2020, provided that stockholders have provided sufficient disclosure on how to access the meetings and are not limited in their participation rights. On the institutional investor front, Vanguard's 2020 proxy voting policy provides that it will vote against proposals to conduct virtual-only meetings. But BlackRock, Fidelity, and State Street have not adopted formal voting policies on virtual-only meetings. Notably, Vanguard's guidance was issued in 2019 prior to the outbreak of the pandemic in the U.S. For further discussion on virtual meetings, you can refer to our memo titled Recent Development Regarding Virtual Shareholder Meetings, which is available on our website. The pandemic is also presenting challenges with respect to stakeholder engagement, both in preparation for the annual meeting and outside the annual meeting context. When communicating with stockholders or investor analysts, directors, senior management, and IR teams need to be mindful that Regulation FT still applies during this challenging period. And as a result, they must be careful not to reveal material non-public information, in other words, MNPI, about the impact of the pandemic on the company's current or future performance. Directors and executives should refresh their knowledge of best practices for Reg FD compliant stockholder engagement and work closely with the company's internal legal team as needed. Boards of directors and senior management will also understandably have desire to communicate with their employees during these challenging times and keep them updated on the company's operations and business outlook as appropriate. While these communications are not generally subject to Reg FD, caution should be exercised in sharing MNPI with employees and employees should be reminded as appropriate that insider trading laws restrict them from trading on this information until it is made public or is no longer relevant. Lastly, I'm going to be discussing considerations for managing some of the potential long-term consequences of the pandemic. While public company boards and management are understandably focused on the unprecedented crisis affecting their employees, customers, and communities, after these critical issues have been addressed, boards and management are likely to face a number of follow-on consequences of the crisis. Notably, the equity values of many companies have declined during the last month. This increases the risk of hostile takeovers and shareholder activist activity because it is less costly for the activists or the potential unsolicited acquired to accumulate a substantial stake. For example, the 2008 financial crisis was followed by significant increases in the number of hostile offers, proxy fights, activism, and event-driven investing. In light of this increased takeover and shareholder activism risk, it is important for companies and their boards to remain current on investor buying activities, pay attention to market rumors, and monitor the securities for unusual accumulations or trades. If necessary, companies and their boards should also consider proactive preparative steps, such as working with the company's proxy solicitor to monitor investment activity, boarding with its financial advisors regarding potential acquirers or activists, 
and discussing related considerations with outside counsel. Increased monitoring is especially important in this environment because some standard monitoring techniques become less effective when a company's market cap decreases significantly. For example, the Hart Scott Rodino Improvements Act has historically been a helpful indicator of an incoming approach because it requires acquirers to make antitrust filing for investments over a certain threshold. Threshold is not tied to the percentage of the company's outstanding stock, but is rather set at a dollar amount, which is currently 94 million. As market capitalizations of companies decrease, this threshold represents a larger percentage of stock that an acquirer may accumulate without being detected. Note, however, that investors are also subject to other disclosure regimes, including Schedule 13D filings with the SEC. In the activism context in particular, over the coming months, there may be an increase in activist demands that combine the activist primary investment theses with criticism of management's COVID-19 preparedness and response. As and when management has time and resources available amidst the crisis, Managers should consider whether its public disclosures provide a cohesive narrative regarding the company's leadership efforts to respond to and mitigate the crisis. Now may be also a good time for boards to dust off rights plans that they may have on the shelf. For example, by having a board information session to refresh directors on the terms of their shelf rights plan. Many companies maintain shelf rights plans, which give them the ability to adopt a plan quickly if and when a specific threat arises. For companies that do not have a rights plan on the shelf, this may be a good time to consider adding them. A rights plan, A, prevents a bidder or others from accumulating a substantial position in the company for so long as the plan is in effect. B, enhances a board's negotiating leverage. And C, provides time to seek out and consider alternatives if a board decides to, thereby increasing the likelihood that any resulting transaction is in the best interest of the company and its stockholders. Recently, an increased number of companies have adopted rights plans to defend against potential approaches. This includes high-profile examples such as Occidental Petroleum, which adopted a rights plan shortly after Carl Icahn disclosed a 9.9% stake in the company, and Dave & Buster's, which adopted a rights plan amidst a nearly 90% decline in its market cap in a one-month period. At the time Dave & Buster adopted its rights plan, KKR had disclosed an 8.3% stake in the company. Another important consideration for companies and their boards in defending against an unsolicited offer is the company's intrinsic value. In many hostile situations, the reason that the board chooses not to engage with a potential acquirer is because it believes the company's intrinsic value is higher than what is being offered by the acquirer. This may be especially relevant today, given the sharp decline in equity valuations across numerous sectors over the last month. It can be very difficult to convince stockholders that depressed prices do not justify selling the company for less than its intrinsic value in a volatile environment, especially because newer stockholders who have recently acquired shares at a lower price may be more receptive to an unsolicited offer that undervalues the company. The board should review the company's projections and business plan with management to ensure alignment on the company's prospects and intrinsic value and to promote cohesion amongst the members of the board and management. These discussions will necessarily include an analysis of any updates to the company's projections and business plan in response to changing economic circumstances and business outlook caused by the pandemic. For further information on activism and takeover preparedness considerations, you can reference our memo titled Impact of COVID-19 on Shareholder Activism and Unsolicited Offers, which is available on our website. This segues nicely into my next point, which is earnings adjustments. Beyond depressed equity valuations, for a number of public companies, the effects of the pandemic will also cause earnings results to materially differ from previous estimates and current market expectations. This has raised a number of difficult questions regarding how and when to update earnings guidance. Companies and their boards may consider either doing a pre-release of earnings or announcing a change in guidance. In fact, a number of companies have already opted to pull their 2020 earnings guidance altogether given current uncertainty. High-profile examples include Twitter, FedEx, and the Coca-Cola company. Of course, these discussions regarding earnings guidance constitute MNPI. As discussed above, companies and their boards should ensure that all employees in possession of MNPI are made aware they cannot trade on MNPI until it is either made public or is no longer relevant. Further, in light of changing and uncertain business outlooks, potential reductions in income from operations, 
tightening credit markets, and in some cases, interest in making sure government relief will be available to them. A number of companies and their boards are reassessing their capital allocation strategies and balance sheets. Recently, several companies have announced changes to their share buyback and dividend policies and made large draws on their revolved credit facilities. U.S. public companies have engaged in stock buybacks at historical levels in recent years. But now, as boards weigh potential reductions in income from operations and political considerations surrounding potential future involvement in government relief programs, some boards are considering putting buyback programs on hold. For example, last week, the U.S. food fast food company Yum Brands announced it was suspending its $2 billion share buyback program. Companies may also consider canceling their existing 10B51 plans as part of the company's reassessment of its capital allocation strategy. Companies are permitted to cancel 10B51 plans even when the company possesses MMPI, so long as it is a full cancellation of the plan and not an amendment. However, it is important to consider the rationale for canceling the 10B51 plan very carefully and to ensure the plan is being canceled for a legitimate purpose because cancellation can create a suspicion the plan was not entered into in good faith. The company will not be permitted to put a new plan in place until it no longer has MNPI. On the other hand, directors of companies with ample cash on hand may determine that depressed market valuations make a stock buyback more attractive than in prior years. In such cases, it is important to remember that companies cannot engage in stock buybacks when they are in possession of MNPI, other than the context of Rule 10b-51. A number of companies are also reassessing their dividend policies as part of their overall evaluation of their capital allocation strategies. Board should be mindful that there are additional complications if the dividend has already been declared. Under Delaware law, once a Delaware corporation has declared a dividend, it generally creates a debtor-creditor relationship between the corporation and its stockholders that cannot be revoked. Practically, if the dividend has been declared, but the record date has not yet occurred, then the corporation can reset the record date to a later date and effectively avoid the payment by delaying it. However, if the record date has already passed, then the corporation is required to pay the dividend, but only to the extent that are funds lawfully available for the payment. A number of companies have also taken steps in recent weeks to enhance their liquidity positions by announcing expenditure cuts and drawing on their revolvers to add cash to their balance sheets. For example, Ford Motor Company recently borrowed $15.4 billion on two of its credit lines. Ford has been joined by other notable names such as Kraft Heinz, which drew on all its availability on its $4 billion revolver, and Marriott, which drew down $2.5 billion. A revolver draw by itself may trigger disclosure on Form 8K, depending on the size of the draw compared to the company's existing debt obligations and other factors regarding the materiality of the draw. Finally, the economic fallout from the pandemic has raised various new executive compensation and employment challenges. A number of companies are evaluating director and executive compensation and benefit arrangements in light of business outlook. For example, CEOs of various U.S. airlines, including Delta, United, Southwest, and JetBlue, have announced pay cuts. In the case of Delta, both its CEO and its directors agreed to forego their salaries over the next six months. Further, the potential impact of the pandemic on companies' 2020 performance will likely impact their performance-based awards. For example, lower stock prices create the need to issue more shares per dollar value of an award, which means companies may run out of authorized shares under their plans sooner. Also, compensation committees may consider making cash awards instead of stock awards given market volatility, or on the other hand, preserving cash by issuing more non-cash equity awards. Companies that have not already mailed their proxies should carefully consider the disclosure surrounding executive compensation given the heightened focus on executive compensation topics. The spread of the pandemic has also raised the difficult question of how to deal with a senior executive who has contracted COVID-19. Learning that a senior executive and a close colleague is ill can both be disruptive to a company's operations and unsettling for its stockholders. However, the news can be substantially more disruptive if it is leaked and therefore incomplete or unmanaged because the company's disclosure processes and its transparency is called into question. Because there is no specific rule or duty that requires disclosure of a senior executive's health issues, companies facing this situation in the context of COVID-19 will likely be called upon to evaluate the specific circumstances and determine the best course among the available disclosure options. 
while taking into account the executive's own privacy rights and personal concerns. Companies should review their succession plans to prepare for the unavailability of one or more executives due to COVID-19. For further discussion on this topic, you can reference our memo titled Senior Executive Illness Due to COVID-19, Disclosure Considerations for U.S. Public Companies, which is also available on our website. The COVID-19 pandemic is heightening the importance of an engaged board as boards are being called upon to address a number of new challenges and uncertainties. Of course, given time constraints, today I've only given you highlights of certain governance considerations facing directors in navigating challenges related to the pandemic. You can find more detailed information on the issues I've discussed today on our website, www.solveprom.com, under the heading Coronavirus SNC Updates. My partners and I are also available to discuss any of the matters I reviewed today at your convenience and provide assistance in this a certain time. Thank you for listening to SNC Critical Insights. Thank you.